this is Trevor Sternad from the Black Dahlia Murder here, and you're listening to the Ever Black Podcast. Hey, human scum, this is odorous from Guam. I'm going to the Fear Factory. This is George Corps, Commander Fisher. This is Jasmine Delegate. This is Wade from Our Last Enemy. This is Mike Smith from Two Thousand Tennessee. He is at Wednesday 13. This is Bruce Lee. This is Rex from Kill Devil Hill. This is Gary Lee from Simple Tour, and you're listening to Ever Black Podcast. Before we go into this episode of the Ever Black Podcast, we just need to give a shout out to our show supporters, the occult clothing brand Electric Witch. We have amazing apparel from shirts to hoodies to hats to beanies, dresses and more. Check out their full range at electricwitch.com.au and put in the code EVERBLACK for 20% off your order. Also, don't forget to subscribe, rate and review the Ever Black Podcast on Spotify and iTunes podcast streams and see all our video interviews on the Ever Black YouTube channel. You can also read all our articles and reviews at everblack.com.au. All right, on with the show. Stephen Wilson, thank you for joining us on the show, mate. Uh, your new album, The Future Bites. Mate, I genuinely really, really love this album, dude. Like, Thank you. I, I've, I, I, I can't stop listening to it. And it's just, it's just really resonated with me. And it's, it's so different, but it's got all those familiar threads throughout your career. I, think it's, I honestly think it's the best thing you've done yet. I love it so much. I'm very happy to hear you say that. I kind of feel that too, but then I always feel that with every record I make. <laughs> but there's some, I, but I agree. I think there's something special about this record, yes. uh, and I, th- I, I, I try to rationalise what it is for me. It's obviously the fact that it is superficially it is a really quite a significant reinvention in sound. Yes. But at the same time, at the same time as you kind of hinted, it also sounds completely like me. So it isn't, but it is. But it's also the fact I think I've always tried with all of my records to walk that kind of balancing line between something that's very sophisticated, very layered, and you can really engage with as a sort of sonic journey. But at the same time, I love great pop melodies and I love accessibility and I love immediacy. Um, and I've tried to walk that line where, where this, it's very easy to walk into the, the, you know, walk through the door into this music yes. because the melodies are good. But once you're in the room, there's all this other stuff to explore. And I feel like with this record, more than any other I've made, I've kind of achieved that. Yeah. So it's very good. Very nice for me to to, to hear you say that. Yeah. Yeah. uh, It's, mate, it it is. And you mentioned like, uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it a pop record because I guess that's, I mean, it's pop today seems like it's more of a dirty word in the mainstream sense. It's got more substance got, than that. It's got, you know what I mean? Yeah. I think rock, pop is a dirty, well, let's be specific here. Pop is a dirty word with fans of rock music. I don't, I don't think pop is a dirty word. I mean, pop is a, is a glorious thing. Yes. Uh, you know, to, to a Billie oh. Eilish fan or a Lady Gaga fan or an Arcade Fire fan, pop is not a dirty word. But I think you're right. People who come from the tradition of, you know, classic rock music, as I do, and yes. I'm suspecting you do too, Pop has always been a, a word that people are deeply suspicious of. Um, I haven't been, partly because I grew up in a house where I would hear ABBA as much as I heard Pink Floyd. I'm talking about what my parents listened to. Yeah, of course. Um, and I would hear the Bee Gees as much as I would hear Frank Sinatra and Mozart. So to me, pop was everything. Pop was popular music. And if you think about it, who is the most famous pop group of all time? The Beatles. Oh, of course. Yeah. It's not rock, is it? You wouldn't call the Beatles a rock band. At least I wouldn't. I'd say they're a pop group and in, in the best possible sense of the word. And almost everyone likes the Beatles. And, and for many people, they are the definitive, d- definitive band. And yet they are essentially a pop group, a group that focused on writing great, melodic, three-minute, catchy pop songs. And so for me, but I think you're right because you said, well, in the... I think it's kind of changed now. People's idea of modern pop yes. is, is something that comes more from the tradition of urban music, electronic music. And I think for a lot of rock fans, obviously that is something that they don't like. So pop, they associate pop now with that world. Um, I still think there's some incredible music being made in, in that. Uh, it actually was stuff myself and my co-producer David were listening to or making the record, you know, things like Billie Eilish and some of Kanye West and Kendrick Lamar, even if I didn't like all of it, 
there was always something about it that kind of excited me and that it was very fresh. Yeah, yeah, it didn't, yeah. It didn't seem to be stuck the way that rock music is stuck now. At least it seems to me rock music is stuck in this kind of world where it's kind of always following by group Beatles and Led Zeppelin and Black Sabbath. We're kind of stuck in that world yeah, in the rock true. world. And then you listen to stuff like Billie Eilish and they don't have any of that baggage. It's almost like they don't know what they don't know, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, th- you know, they didn't grow up in a world where the Beatles was everything. So they're kind of making music in this kind of way that, to me, sounds really fresh and really exciting. Even if I don't necessarily like it, I, I kind of admire the modern, the modern pop world, at least the more interesting end of it, yeah. And plus, I mean, you're a dad. You've got, you've got two, two girls. So you'd be mm. surrounded with a lot of that stuff. Like my daughter, my youngest daughter, mm. like she, I, I'll hear sounds coming from her, her room that she's playing. And I'm like, it's, some of it's not too bad, man. Like I, I, she's not listening. I guess she's not listening to all the auto tuny sort of stuff, mm. but there's right. some really like stuff that I've even gone, Oh, that's not too bad. Hey, I don't know. <laughs> you know, there's some incredible stuff. There's yeah. some incredible stuff. I mean, I could, I could name you four or five songs that probably classic rock fans w- would, wouldn't think that I would love, that I think are, are amongst the best pieces of pop music I've ever heard. Uh, Billie Eilish, Bury a Friend. Yes. Uh, Azalea, uh, Azalea Banks, 212. Kanye West on site, Black Skinhead. Uh, I mean, these, you know, Daft Punk's Get Lucky. I think these songs are so good. And they are all songs that have come along in the 21st century. And... Let's be honest, there hasn't been anything from the rock tradition, the world of rock music in the 21st century, really, mm. that has competed with those in terms of being great pieces of three minute pop or three minute rock. Yeah. Um, and so that, that, you know, that idea that rock music has failed to reinvent itself, it doesn't surprise you then that it's kind of disappearing, at least it is in Europe, I don't know about in Australia, but rock music yeah. has really disappeared from, from mainstream pop culture. It has. Yeah. And I think, yeah, it's the same, yeah. And I think it only has itself to blame. It hasn't reinvented itself in the way that urban music is kind of, you know, and that's why kids, are, and also, you know, we have to acknowledge that the kids today are growing up in a world where the sound that they are constantly hearing in their everyday lives is electronic from their laptops, from their mm. iPads, from their phones, even the doorbell ringer, you know, <laughs> it's all, it's all electronic sound. Their, their musical vocabulary is one of electronic sound. The guitar, the guitar and the drums and the bass are things that don't belong to their, their audio world and their audio experience. So it's not surprising that that music has evolved away from that. And I think probably on balance, that's a good thing. I like that music continues to evolve, even if I mourn. Of course, I do. I mourn yeah. the passing of rock music because it's it's so special to me, and I grew up listening to it. But I also am excited by the fact that music does continue to reinvent itself in that respect. And I think you're you're really uh, following that flow as well with with your career, and and that's why I think I really like that and respect this album so much, and the subject matter lyrically and its themes of everything that's going on in the world right now it's very very relevant and it's it's kind of terrifying (laughs) like you know it was done to my understanding the album was done in the can before the pandemic and everything really Mm. hit head so i mean that's that's yeah it, it it's it's one of the strange things about this record that it became by accident it's become even more relevant in a way Mm. because you're right i mean it was finished in january last year i mean literally just as covid was around the corner we we, finished the record and and uh could never have anticipated how how relevant and topical it would become uh over the last year but at the same time uh, it was written at a time when um we in the uk were going through the whole brexit yeah bullshit which was incredibly depressing um, and brought out some of the worst aspects of, of the human race, you know, some of the worst kind of, you know, nationalism and all that shit 
that Brexit, you know, we don't want foreigners in our country, so we're going to vote to go out of Europe. I mean, that was so depressing yeah. to, to be experiencing that. And also we were in the middle of the Trump administration, which actually similarly, I think he brought out the very worst aspects of the people that followed him. Yes. Those, those kind of prejudices that had obviously always been there. And he gave them license to express them again. And that was deeply depressing. So I, when I was writing the record, I was aware of that and how social media had facilitated a lot of what I call the politics of hate, yes. you know, proliferating again. And so the album became about how social media had altered our sense of identity, how it had altered the way we consume. And, you know, Personal Shopper is obviously about that side of things mm. and how we all see ourselves reflected back in the mirror of social media now. And we've all become, so, you know, we've all become pretty much familiar with the notion of what it means to be a celebrity. Yeah. Because if yep. you if you're posting pictures of yourself and videos of yourself and opinions online now and sharing them with people you will never meet, it's almost like what it means to, that's what being a, a celebrity used to be. Yeah. yeah. Um, so let pop stars and movie stars were the only people that kind of experienced that, you know, where they would say something or do something or make something and people that they never met would, would engage with it and express opinions about, it. but now everyone kind of lives in that world where they're posting, you know, part of their life up for the rest of the universe to potentially right. see and seeing themselves reflected back in that mirror. And that is deeply fascinating, but also deeply scary Terrifying. because it's, it, it's knocking the course of human evolution onto a completely different trajectory and not a particularly good one. Uh, as far as I'm concerned. I agree there. And the whole thing with um, like your latest vi video for self, man, that, that actually scared me a lot. <laughs> it's it's no, no. pretty cool though, isn't it? Yeah. It's yeah. awesome. But yeah. to think that there's that technology that can actually yeah. Oh, yeah. do that, that, yeah. you know, that in the wrong hands, I think about that a lot. <laughs> and, yeah. you know, and the, and the really scary thing about that is it's just the beginning. Yes. It's, just the beginning we're in the very infancy of that kind of technology there will come a time when you cannot believe anything you see online i mean we're almost at that point now you know but it's only going to get worse and can you believe anything you see and of course the whole pro pro the whole the whole idea of the self video is you know making that that kind of process very transparent by using very famous people. Yes. But yeah, they, yeah. they, they needn't have been famous people. They could have just been people that I decided that I would rather look a bit more like him or her, or, you know, whatever, or I'd rather present myself to the world as if I'm a young black female, um, you know, uh, you know, whatever it is I want to present myself as to the world, I can potentially do that now. And that's that's really re for people like you and me that have been around since the beginning of the dawn of, of social media <laughs> and the internet. It's true, yeah. To see, to see the technology going that way, some might say inevitably, mm. inevitably. Because I tell you what, there are a lot of science fiction writers writing in the mid 20th century that predicted this. They predicted this. That Arthur C. Clarke, Philip K. Dick, they predicted that human beings would invent technology that would one day enslave them. Well, hey, the only thing they got wrong was that they imagined it would be robots walking around. Yeah. Well, it isn't robots walking around, but everything else they got right. We are, we are essentially slaves now to, to the technology we've created, which is fascinating and terrifying in equal measure. It is, you know, but we, we get stuck into it. Hey, like we like our little, uh, our little phones and our little escapes. We got a, I've found the one thing about this whole pandemic and everything going on i found myself sort of really reflecting on all of those things like i'm trying to make a conscious effort now to you know throw the phone down and not get too yeah, yeah you know yeah, it's yeah. too easy to it's so easy to and i guess that's what the album really covers in a lot of ways hey it's like that slavery <laughs> to to pleasure Slave, slave, slave slaves to the technology that we've created yeah slavery to our devices yeah our mm -hmm. personal devices I mean, completely, you know, that whole thing about how, you know, when you receive a like or a text message or an email, it, it, it you know, it, 
it's the dopamine in your bloodstream that creates a little buzz. It's almost like taking a drug or something. And so it kind of, um, it plays into some of the worst aspects of, of human nature, particularly social media and that whole thing about needing likes, needing views, needing comments, needing that kind of self-validation that people talking about you or commenting on what you posted mm. or liking what you posted. But there's also the flip side of that, the trolling and the people disliking it and making negative comments. And um, that is also, you know, particularly to young kids, that's also a horrible trend. Yes. And no, no surprise, to, you know, no surprise to see the correlation between that and an increase in teenage suicides and things like that. So it's a, it's an ugly, it's a very ugly thing as well as a, as a beautiful thing. And as always, it's, it's not down to the technology. It's about, it's about the way the human beings engage with it. That's the problem. That's always been the problem. Yes, no, absolutely. And I mean, there's the uh, website as well, the Future Bites website, and you've got all yeah. the different products on there. Like was the canned air an actual thing? Okay. No, it wasn't. No. <laughs> I, I, I thought about maybe stringing you along and saying, oh, well, that's for you to, to figure out. Um, yeah. No. I mean, it, there were some things on the, on the website that were real, uh, but it was like, it was kind of like hiding the, hiding the, uh, hiding the fakes within the real things to, to, you know, which again comes back to exactly what we were just talking about. Doesn't it? Can you believe what you see? Yes. No, I mean that, that whole concept about almost parodying the world of, modern consumerism and particularly the world of, of um, high concept, high designer consumer items, things that we really don't need, but that actually we love to buy. And, and, you know, that a lot of that's done with incredible affection, you know, because that list of things that Elton reads in the middle of personal shopper, a lot of those yeah. things are a big part of my world, you know, the box sets, the 180 gram vinyl, all that stuff. You know, I love that shit, you know. So it's done with affection. But again, it's that looking at that world where we've got to the point now where if some, if a 50 cent T-shirt has the right logo imprinted on it, it suddenly becomes a $500 T-shirt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and how people actually buy into that and they love that. You know, they know they're buying something that's only worth 50 cents, but hey, it's got the Supreme logo on it or, or Virgil Abloh designed it. So it's worth it. Yeah. And, and that's, that's fascinating to me too. I, again, part of me thinks that it's actually a lot of fun, but there's also something a bit worrying about that too, isn't it? So the whole visual aesthetic was kind of riffing, riffing on that, that whole world of high concept, almost like the way Apple would promote a product, you know? You mentioned who 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 reads that list out? You said Elton. That's not Elton John reads that list out. Yeah. Are you serious? Why I did not know that. Oh really? Okay. You must be the only person on the planet that's listened to the record and doesn't realize that's Elton John. Oh man, John I don't know. Because I, I, I guess I was so engrossed. Like I, I just wanted to experience. Oh, I love that. I love that that you didn't know that. But I, usually that's the first thing people ask me is how do you get out? How did you get Elton John on your record? Yeah, it's Elton John uh, in the middle of Personal Shopper that's that's reading that list of, of consumer items. Yeah. Was he in the studio with you? He wasn't. Um, he was on the other end of the phone, uh, but he because he was in I think he was in L.A. or south of France or something when he did it. <laughs> but you know what? He was so lovely and he was so easy to work with and he was so engaged with that. And he just loved the whole concept. And he's so perfect for it because he's the most famous yeah. consumer. He's the most famous shopper on earth, isn't he? So he, he, he totally got it and he loved the fact that he was almost sending himself up. Um, but obviously that was such a thrill, thrill for me to get him on the, on the track. I, yeah. I, yeah. I was so engrossed with the whole album that I, I, I didn't really read the notes or anything with the credits. Right, that's great. I love that. I, I love that. Enjoy that yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I just want to enjoy it. And I'm actually really blown away. I'm gonna have all these people like going, you idiot. But hey man, <laughs> I just I just do what I do. But um there was also the um that limited edition box set you did for charity. There was like the one yeah. off. Mate, that's a, such an incredible thing. And was that fun putting together for that? You must have been you know. Yeah, I mean, it was an extension, uh, you know, the, that, that thing we were just talking about, the high concept, the, the world of high concept, high designer products. And yeah. I, I loved the idea of 
you know, one of the things that was fascinating, fascinating me about the world of, of say art, you know, painting and sculpture is that that whole world is, is based on the idea that there's one piece, a painter or sculptor creates a single unique piece and that single unique piece will sell at a premium price to a, to a collector. And that collector then has the choice of whether they want to display it in a, in a, in a gallery or they just want to put it over their, you know, over their fireplace in their front room and not share it with anyone else. And that's fascinating me that because I was kind of curious about what would, what would the equivalent be in yeah. the world of music? You know, what would it be like to create a single unique piece that would sell to a collector for a ridiculous amount of money? You know, <laughs> at least it was to me. Was, so we thought, what would be the most ridiculous yeah. amount of money to charge that? Like 10 grand, let's charge 10,000 pounds. No one's going to buy that, are they? But it doesn't matter because it's a concept. And of course, it's sold out in a minute. And there was about 10 people bidding against each other, which is very flattering. But also, it's amazing because the money went to a very, very good cause. Absolutely. Um, the Music Venue Trust. So I was really chuffed about that. But that was really the, the, the starting point to create the, you know, we, talk, we talked about this high, high design and high concept thing and the kind of elitism and snobbery that goes along with that, you know. I own a pair of these trainers and it's almost like, it's not about whether they're good trainers or not. It's about the fact they've got the right logo on them. And so I like that idea of what would be the ultimate elitist music product. It would be a box set of which only one copy will ever be manufactured. And so in that box, I put a bunch of really unique things like my Grammy nomination certificate. We pressed one copy of a seven inch single, which has an exclusive track on it um you know handwritten lyrics literally the handwritten lyrics with coffee stains and all my crossings out things that only one copy can ever exist and to make the ultimate music collectible and in order to raise money for you know for a great cause so i, I loved i loved doing it it was as you say it was a lot of fun to do for sure a lot of fun man i i think you know if anyone else did it they'd probably you know, there's people out there, they'd be like, oh, I've got all this money now. I'm going to go put it. But you did it from the heart. And I think that's what it, it, it that was important about it. So, yeah, because I, I think, yeah, I mean, I, I, if I'd done it and if I'd kept the money, I think it would have been seen as something deeply cynical, actually. But mm. but I did not want it to be deeply cynical. And I wasn't interested in the money. For me, it was fun. And it yes. was a kind of gag. It was like a, a, a kind of joke that I wanted to play, but a joke that I wanted people to feel included in, you know, yeah. not the expense of it. Um, and I think people got it. You know, I'm sure there's a few Thank people you. that got upset by it, but I think most people got it. Yeah. yeah. Mate. Well, at least, you know, there's not going to be any bootlegs, bootlegs on wish of it, you know? Well, there might be, <laughs> I mean, you know, <laughs> if, if the guy, if the guy that's bought it turns out to be a bootlegger, who knows? <laughs> you know, you can, Start knocking them out, knocking them out of the well, back door. At least you're yeah. going to know who he is so you can rock up on his door. No, I do. I yeah. do. We do know who he is. He's a, he's a real, as you could expect, he's a real collector and a real, yes. a long, a long term fan and, and, and admirer of mine. So that, that I'm very happy. He seemed really happy with it. He made his own little unboxing video, which you can see online. Yeah, yeah. And he seems really chuffed with it. And I'm happy about that. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome, man. Well, uh, of course, I really hope that we can see you down here in Australia as well. Um, once this is, uh, hopefully, I don't know. It, it's fingers hard to tell, man. mate. Fingers, fingers crossed. Cause man. yeah, I, I, I don't know. You've got a great relationship with us down here. We love seeing you. I Always love, good. I love coming to Australia. Yeah. It's, it's exhausting. Yes. Cause you do the three other, the three shows in four, what are four days and you, but I abs and the jet lag and everything, but I absolutely love every second of it. Yeah. So, uh, I can't wait, mate. Yeah. Fingers crossed. Yeah, man. Well, uh, Stephen, it's been awesome hanging with you again, mate. And uh, the Future Bites is out now everywhere. I'm going to have the links down here so everyone can go get it. Go buy physical copies, people. Support the man. That's that's what I got to say, especially right now. Brother, thank you. Thank you so much. And it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you, mate. And, and have a great day in Australia. I will. I'm off to work. Woo! <laughs> okay. All right. Cheers, man. Thanks, buddy. Speak soon.